The question, who am I, is one of the most pervasive questions that human beings encounter. That question just don't, just won't go away, no matter our age or stage in life. Almost 2,500 years ago, the philosopher Socrates wrote that the unexamined life is not worth living. The answers we find during the examination of our life shapes who we are, the decisions we make, and the communities we choose for ourselves. There is something hardwired in many of our brains that keeps us searching and it makes the transformation of our lives possible. Much earlier in human history, we would have belonged to a tribe or clan for survival meant belonging. Many small towns, especially in the South, still feel that way. Every person knew his or her place in the community and knew they belonged. There's a wonderful story in Wayne Muller's book, How Then Shall We Live, that reminds us of some of the community, of what some communities are like and how people learn to know who they are. It's a story from, uh, of an indigenous people in Africa. And in that, among that people, the birth of a child is counted not from the day that person was born or when they were conceived, but when the mother heard the song of the child who wanted to be born. And so when the woman hears that song, she then talks to her partner and teaches him the song. And then they sing the song as they procreate. And while the, the woman is pregnant, she, she teaches the midwives and the people of the village the song of that child. And so when the child is born, the whole village knows that song. And the child grows up hearing that their song is special and unique. And when that child marries, the village sings the songs of the two people who are to be married. And so it goes. New people who come into the village are taught the song also. And it is the song that is sung to the person when they come to die. There's something that touches our hearts about this kind of deep belonging and connection within a community. The reality is that that can be a blessing or it can limit our sense of self. Today, this kind of community relatedness is so foreign to our culture that it's difficult to imagine that kind of connection within the human community that both accepts and perhaps limits who we can become. For millennia, out of necessity or longing to be our own person, human beings have explored new places, searching for food or trading goods, moving because of drought or in famine, or exploring the unknown for curiosity or riches. In these journeys, our ancestors often lost the roots of who they were, roots tied to place, to the land, to a heritage. We can still see reminders of the previous heritage that peoples brought to this country in names that were often connected to crafts or skills. Names like weaver, tinker, bookbinder, tailor, farmer, smith, all initially emerged from the job or skill a family passed down. It went with the name. 
In the immigration to the United States, many families had their names taken away to be replaced by simple names that were easily spoken in English, and so the connections to heritage and family were lost. Many more people in this nation still bear the names of their owners, a sad legacy of slavery. Now it's our turn. We must find who we are, just like Henry Box Brown. We all want desperately to know that we are seen as a person for who we are and for the potential that resides within us. We are not bound by the expectations of one's family's legacy. We understand that we are creating our own legacy built during our life journey. Our task is to seek out a path that will enable us to know more and understand more about who we are becoming. Life has changed for humanity as the movement of people around the world has become the norm. The name IBM became I've Been Moved. The fact that we are a university community means that many of the people we care about in this room, in this community, will eventually move. We are a transient community. To find connections in new places, we have ex exchanged our familial connections for labels that help us find a place in this culture. The old Southern saying that I learned as a child of, who are your people? Anybody else heard that? That, that means that if we visit long enough, we're bound to find some familial or friendship connection. But that no longer applies for most of us. We have labels. Many of them are helpful as we seek healing and wholeness. And while our labels often identify us, they can also shape who we are when we take those labels into our psyches, then we can become limited by those labels. Too often, the spiritual teacher Carolyn May says, we lead with our wounds when we meet new people. We are a child of an alcoholic family, a cancer survivor, a divorcee, a rape victim, a drug addict, in recovery, mentally ill, in Al-Anon, there are lots more labels. But they only speak to certain aspects of who we are. The challenge for us comes when we take our label and let it become part of our inner being, de defining who we are. We become known by labels. When not addressed, our labels, the hardships in early life stay with us and shape our relationships, our responses to other people, our personal prejudices. We are called to become more than the labels we have been given or have chosen. I have a friend who um, is a Fordham, a uh, formidable 91-year-old, and about five years ago, she was asked to be the annual poster child as a breast cancer survivor. She was indignant. Though she has contributed generously to cancer research groups, she was clear that she did not allow herself to be labeled by the cancer that she had, I don't know, 30 35 years ago. 
she said to me one day, that is not who I am. I've journeyed on, and I'm not sure that I want to go back to that label. Her sense of self-identity was not bound by what had happened. She continues to explore and see new aspects of her life. Of course, every faith and philosophical tradition encourage us to remember who we truly are. Whether we hear the Buddhist teaching about human beings having a Buddha seed within or earth-centered traditions reminding us of our connection to the earth or Jesus reminding us that we are the light of the world. Knowing ourselves means affirming a core sense of our unique presence on earth the gift of our being. Pablo Casals, the cellist, pointedly inquires how we see ourselves and our children. He wrote, when will we teach our children in school what they are? We should say to each of them, do you know what you are? You are a marvel. You are unique. In all of the world, there is no other child exactly like you. In the millions of years that have passed, there has never been another child like you. And look at your body. What a wonder it is. Your legs, your, your arms, your cunning fingers, the way you move. You may become a Shakespeare, a Michelangelo, a Beethoven, you have the capacity for anything. Yes, you are a marvel. When you grow up, then, can you harm another who, like you, is also a marvel? We try to teach our children that, but have we remembered that each of us is that child also. We are called to remember over and over that the potential within us needs to be nurtured. This is not a simple process for our expanding self-understanding and acceptance of who we truly are because it's the hardest work we'll ever do. It means taking the courageous step to re release those old labels and messages in our lives so we can become something more. Perhaps it even means letting go of relationships that are not healthy for us so we can experience a transformation of heart and mind. So we have some choices that we need to make on our life journey. We can stay where we are, bloom where we're planted. We can explore a bit and then decide, is this where I belong? Or we can continue to journey and grow. The question is, what is it that we want from our lives? We certainly know that sometimes we journey along for a while and then we stop when the exploration gets a little rough. Sometimes we stop when we uncover some of the difficult aspects of our being that we've kept hidden away. We often just stumble over emotions or memories when life challenges us and we have to face reality. We human beings are so blessed with the ability to live in denial and avoidance of some of the hard things in our lives. It's much easier just to ignore hurt feelings or painful memories 
than to really look at the difficult places in our lives. However, there are times, particularly during big transitions or losses in our lives, when things we thought we had left behind rear up to hit us over the head or bite us you know where, and then we're pushed into processing and learning more about ourselves because of our challenges. When challenges occur, as they surely will, we need to remember that what helped us before may not be sufficient for where we are now in our lives. My friend Michael would often say to me, and by the way, his wife is the one that got indignant about being the uh, breast cancer poster child. They were a formidable couple. He would sometimes say to me that, you know, we have a learned line in our lives. And we return to that learned line every time life gets challenging. The problem is that our learned line happens when we're like three or four. If our learn line is positive, that's wonderful. But some of us had childhoods and lessons that really don't work for us as adults, even though we continue to return to that three or four year old behavior. Shifting and releasing that old, immature mindset is part of what we need to examine if we're to become fully self-actualized people. My friend Don puts it another way. He's nearing retirement and has been a marriage and family therapist his whole career and often teaches at the School of Social Work at the University of Georgia. We were visiting one day prior to a visit with his parents and he was shaking his head. He said, you know, I'm over 60 and it only takes me two hours with my parents for me to feel like I'm nine years old again. <laughs> what might have helped us understand ourselves at earlier times in our lives might not be healthy now. A parent dies and we become the elder. The marriage we thought would last is ending. Higher education has reshaped what we want to do with our lives and challenged what our family wants for us. New life situations and old patterns may not be a pretty picture. One of the teaching stories of the Buddha reminds us that it's important to let go of old ways while living in the world. The Buddha tells his students about a man who's on a journey. The man comes to a river that's treacherous on his side of the river, but the shore on the other side is without danger. There's no bridge to cross, so the man must build a raft to cross the river. He gathers the material, he builds the raft, and with his hands and feet, he crosses over the river and makes it safely to the other side. He thinks, this raft has been a great help to me. With its aid, I safely crossed over the river. It would be good if I carry this raft on my head or my back wherever I go. Talk about carrying baggage. <laughs> In hearing the story, it seems so logical that the boat should be put down. But do we? We need to find new ways of coping in order to become who we can be. But that raft was so helpful once. 
Self-knowledge includes knowing when to let go and in that mindfulness and discernment to learn more about ourselves. The two places that can help us learn about ourselves are our personal reflections and our relationships within the communities we choose. We need both to find a balance in the journey of self. It's often our community that helps us engage in our personal growth when we're mindful and pay attention to what we say to people. Are we kind? If not, why not? Do we need to feel like we have power over others? If so, why? Do we have to be right? Do we need to feel we are always in control? Do we use sarcasm or derogatory statements to make ourselves feel better and others feel diminished? When we have a strong reaction to a situation or to another person, might we ask ourselves whether that person has triggered some event or is a reminder of painful memories? I have often found that the people I react to most strongly, and I think a lot of us are like this, are more like us than we would like to admit. Sometimes people remind us of concepts or words that represent a group or issue that we may not have made peace with in our lives. We end up reacting against rather than choosing to be reflective about what is happening. Perhaps we need to take a deep breath and practice mindfulness by paying attention to what's happening in our bodies, what's happening with our emotions when we react strongly to situations. The other reality that's hard for many of us is that living reflectively means that we need to slow down. When we rush too much, we cannot pay attention to our lives or really to those we love. In our relationship with ourselves, we need to remember to be gentle. No matter how old we are, we still make mistakes and we're still learning. There's no shame or guilt in that. We are still figuring out who we want to be when we grow up. We need to remember that the human spirit is flexible. It stretches and expands as we learn and grow. Our ability to be resilient and flexible through life's changes helps us weather the big life transitions. Going off to college, marriage, moving, divorce, death, losing a loved one, retirement, aging, losing a job, illness. All of these life changes force us to re-envision who we are and often how we will live. The shifts are not easy, but time and care help us survive and eventually thrive through big changes. With all of this personal work going on underneath the surface of our community, we need to not only be gentle with ourselves, but also with one another. The paradox of community is that we need to be here to get our needs met and to not focus on ourselves so we can offer others the support they need. The community as well as the individual needs to be flexible. So in other words, community is a really messy process. As we seek to remain flexible and resilient, 
we might discover that our greatest self-understanding comes from our stuck places. So I'm really glad that Paula and, well, that Jorge sang Nowhere Man because that's really about a stuck place in John Lennon's life. There was an early time in the Beatles' career when they'd written lots of songs about love and relationships, and they were trying to complete an album, and John Lennon had spent hours trying to figure out what is the next song going to be. He couldn't think of anything. He gave up. He went to bed because his creativity had left him. But it was only when he let go and didn't try to force it that in his sleep, the song just flowed out. In the song that emerged, we hear the reminder that we have a choice of who we want to be. Do we want to stay in a place of limbo? Do we want to be nowhere? Do we want to let others choose our lives for us, or do we want to choose something more for ourselves? What I found interesting was that the song appeared on the album Rubber Soul, and isn't that what we're talking about? Flexibility and resilience. In order to keep ourselves out of the trap of being a nowhere person, who does not examine life, we're called every day, several times a day, to practice being ourselves. Who I am is both a process of looking back on who I've been and who I want to be in the future. It's an inward journey, and it's a journey in the midst of community. It may be that we didn't have someone who sang the song of our heart when we were born. But in this community, we have people here with us now who will stand beside us, who will journey with us, who will sing with us. Together, we discover who I am who you are. May all that we do be done in love and compassion for ourselves and others. I invite us to rise in body or spirit to share our closing hymn, number 34.